Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we explore the art of improving existing software with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we welcome Nalita Velasquez, who is a speaker, technical blogger, and a senior software engineer at Cobalt Labs. Nalita joins us from Berlin, Germany. Nalita Velasquez, welcome to Maintainable. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So as you reflect on your experience in the industry, what do you believe are a few common characteristics of, dare I say, well-maintained software? There are three things from my perspective, uh, documentation, testing, and consistency. Huge advocate of these three things. I know they can come off as opinion, and many of the things that we do in this industry, um, well, we have to express our opinions. Do you think there's a clear distinction between best practices and our own opinions about how things should be be done? And where does that line get blurry? Yeah, that's... Um... That's the thing. From my perspective, I don't like to say best practices because uh, to me, that's a little bit subjective because what for me is a best practice, it might be, it might look different for you. It might look different for my other teammates. So I always prefer to talk about team agreements and have those discussions when you when you're working together and decide, okay, this is what we are going to do. Uh, this is, um, um, we are going to use this linter and these conventions. And of course we can lean on, you know, other people that has uh, solved the same problems or similar pro- problems and try to draw from, from there. That's what I like to, I like the term of team agreements better over best practices because it's a mutual understanding and we had that discussion we communicated as a team first so for me that's the foundation rather you know me saying this is the best practice or really how did you come to that conclusion i I like that the framing there around team agreements and that kind of assumes that the team came together to agree and agree things where best practices could just have been maybe someone felt like they read an article or read a book once and they're like well this is the best practice because this perceived expert in the community said it should be done this way Um, so we're going to do the same thing we follow best practices but it seems like yeah there's a little bit more nuance there and you also use reference of like linters in your code you know, like we'll have style guides that other companies share on the internet. We're like, oh, we'll use theirs. And then once we start digging into it, we're like, well, I don't really like this part of their their linting patterns. So we might override that with our own thing. But sometimes that stuff is a little less, uh, I, I wonder how often that stuff gets discussed and agreed upon. Or should those types of things be renewed, like agreements, like wedding vows or anything where you have to renew those uh, agreements every once in a while just so we're not just following down the same path that, maybe our predecessors at our current company decided where the agreements or best practices? Absolutely. Um, I had a mentor that used to say a team completely changes when one person leaves or when one person joins that team. So it's a completely different team. So it's important to revisit those team agreements every time that happens uh, because it's, it's an opportunity to to listen to the new new person, uh, hear their perspective and, and, you know, keep that uh, cycle of uh, improving and learning from, from each other. So I think absolutely every time uh, the team changes, uh, those agreements need to be revisited and to hear the perspective of the new team members. Right, right. That's that's great. Do you, uh, you mentioned also like consistency is one of the the three things you see in, in well-maintained software, is that like consistent within community standards or at least consistent within that team? I think it goes back to those team agreements and, and being consistent with those, with those team agreements. You know, when I, when I join, I have joined teams and maybe there's a style that it's 
I don't like it much, but I rather do the things as they are because the cognitive load for myself in the future and for other developers is going to be less if I see the same patterns in the same code base over and over uh, rather than, you know, different different things on the same code base. It, it can be a little bit more difficult to onboard just in general to navigate the, the code base. So I think that consistency goes back to those team agreements. And when I join a team and, you know, by look at things, uh, how things are, have been done in the code base, of course, I can contribute and say, you know, we could do this other way because I see disadvantage, etc. But always I like to keep in mind Okay, do things work as they are, or I'm just trying to reinvent the wheel? And, you know, for me, the most important thing is adapt. And if things are working, I adapt and I prefer to do things in a consistent way. So it's easier for myself and for others. What about in a scenario, Have you, or maybe I don't want to make any assumptions, but have you been part of a scenario where you joined a project or a team and maybe the way things had been done haven't been well done enough that it was kind of a mess and that's why they're bringing in new people to come help improve the situation. How do you find that balance there? We're trying to like make recommendations for improving things when there's kind of a mess to begin with for, for anyone new joining a company or a project. Yeah, that's a that's a tricky one, and I like to do things in small small steps. Um, you know, whenever I join a new team, uh, a new I start learning a new code base. Most of the time, at the beginning, for me, it would be just listening and learning how that code base works. Uh, reading documentation, if there is some documentation, and just trying to understand how the team operates and how the, the code base works along the way. If sometimes when there is no documentation, I like to write that documentation for for others uh, in in the fu- in the future, and also use it as a tool for learning about that code base and share, hey, with my teammates, this is my understanding of how things work. Is that right? And and then we can, you know, have that that uh, communication and learn from each other. So I would rarely come into to a team or a code base and this is what we should do because you know I, I, I assume that whoever made those decisions they made they made those decisions with the best they could with the tools they have, with the information they have at the at the moment and the constraints that they have. And I think this is a trend that I've seen on the industry more and more. Like developers are starting to be more aware of that and, and keeping in mind that, that there is is um we shouldn't be quick to jump and uh, judge and draw conclusions for things that uh, we might not like how they are, but there there is a reason behind. And once you understand those, re- those reasons of why things are the, are the way that they are, then you can start, you know, pointing out the problems and then having those conversations with your with your team and make it as collaborative as possible. You know, I see this problem. What do you think? Is that even a problem? <laughs> you know, because it, Sometimes it might be just bothering me how the specific thing is coded in a specific style or a specific architecture, but it might not be a problem. It might be, again, <laughs> very subjective. Sure. And no, I, I appreciate that. You know, I think a lot, you know, one of, the, one of the topics I was looking forward to discussing was around documentation with you. And when it comes to, especially when you're joining a, uh, an organization, you mentioned, you know, like, go look at the documentation and maybe confirm with your peers, like, is this, is my understanding accurate here? Or is this confirming? Like, I I know that a lot of organizations struggle from having documentation that gets outdated, you know, in some ways, or what other, what do you think contributes to keeping documentation well-maintained? 
Yeah, I think one of the factors is that I think we still don't see documentation as an artifact that is part of your deliverable. I think we're getting there in for testing. Uh, I have experience in teams where we struggle to, you know, to write this because we want to go fast and, you know, we are having trouble selling with stakeholders, why tests are important, et cetera. So sometimes they get sacrificed. And I think, um, or at least I personally try to advocate for, uh, for that and for documentation and say, okay, this piece of software goes along with documentation and test. And what does that mean? It can be generating some documentation if there's a new feature or updating if it, there's something that needs to be updated. And I often hear that uh, that opinion that, oh, I don't write documentation because it gets updated super quick. And then it's again, it's the problem is that there's no person that wants to take ownership of, of that piece of the software because I see it as a piece of the software that you are writing. Uh, so I think that contributes to, to that. Um, if we start seeing it part of or in a more holistic way, the, this is your deliverable. I think it could improve, or we could make some some progress. You mentioned, you know, what is the kind of your, your teams? Is it part? Of, is documentation part of the deliverable? I think it's a, it's a good question. And I've also been thinking a lot around lately that I feel like developers talk a lot about. It would be great to have more of the requirements like really well organized, like whether, regardless of what tool you're using to manage like your features or bug fix tickets issues, whatever, you're, regardless of whether you're using Jira, whatever type tools you're using, there's an emphasis on from a lot of developers being like, the, the thing that I get assigned to work on needs to be well defined, right? So it's like, I might, I need this to be really clear about what the expectations are, what the acceptance criteria are, you know, what does this look like to, from like a feature that we're building? but then not necessarily developers have the same sort of expectation of themselves when they do the work, they build the feature to also document how that might, like what changed or what needs to be updated in the documentation because it's like, it's like, well, I made the thing work and now I'm done. But it's, I think there's that back to the whole team agreement aspect of like, what sort of questions, what sort of questions do you think developers should be asking if they were to think about they're working on a feature or some, a change of the software um, outside of like, does anything need to be documented here? What sort of, what other types of questions do you think would be helpful for people to be asking themselves to finish out that deliverable? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. If I think uh, back on what kind of things I like to include when I write documentation, one is at least some very high level description of the architecture some sort of getting started guide for new team members so they can know how to, what are dependencies that they need, if references to these conventions, if they, we have them, and how to contribute to the project. One of the things that I mentioned also about documentation is uh, the, the closer it, it is to the code, the, the better. Uh, one example that I've seen is uh, with the Spring Boot framework. I often find myself, you know, clicking into classes or functions and reading the the official documentation, and I think that's super super helpful for uh, for developers. So it's I, I would say it's a combination of very high level documentation, what, uh, what, I'm, what we are building and uh, maybe a rough idea, how did we build it? Like, you know, more of like the small details of how this function works or what is the purpose of this, this class. Uh, diagrams, I love diagrams. I love to include diagrams. I think, uh, as they say, uh, uh, an image uh, speaks louder than a thousand words. So I am a big fan of having diagrams. And again, if we go back to speaking about how quickly they can get outdated, I, I agree that that happens. And even in those cases, for me, I've been into projects where 
there are some sort of diagrams, and at least even if they are all, at least they are they are helpful to understand the context of why some decisions were made, how it happened, the code base to evolve. Maybe it was in a certain state, and and now we change something, and at least you have that information to put to start putting pieces together. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Documentation can get outdated, but even in those cases, I personally still find it very helpful and useful. Hi there. Do you know someone who might be looking for assistance with their Ruby on Rails application? Planet Argon would love to meet them. We're offering a $1,000 referral bonus. Send someone our way, and if they sign up for services with Planet Argon, we'll give them a $1,000 discount. And in return, you'll get a check for $1,000 in the mail, just for knowing the right person. Hop on over to planetargon.com referrals for more information and to refer someone our way. That's planetargon.com slash referrals. Thanks. What's your current take on the metaphor technical debt? Do you use it very often in your day-to-day -day work? Yeah. In many projects, we, we have used it to categorize a specific things or tasks we want to do. So I have, yeah, work on projects where we have our technical dev backlog where, you know, developers are free to decide or bring those problems to the team. So in my last project, just for, for as an example, because it's what I last remember, yeah, we had this backlog yeah, developers were able to create ta a task or tickets in our board. And then later we will, in the sprint planning, we will dedicate a specific um, amount of time. It will depend on the, on, the, on the sprint, of course, and the priorities. Developers will, we need to advocate for those things that we want to do because otherwise they don't get done. So we will talk about those take the items and try to accommodate them in the spring if they made sense or if the other priorities allow <laughs> working on, on those items. I've, I've spoken with a, a number of people where they'll talk about like, okay, we created our backlog and the developers are kind of managing that. And they're, and then when it comes to like using your example, like sprint planning session and being an advocate for addressing some of those items, and then feeling like, well, I might have asked a few times about or pitched the idea to do this. And they said, not right now. Let's come back to that another time. Eventually, they stop asking to do it because like, oh, they said no a few times. So they're always going to say no. So this, this doesn't seem important anymore. What sort of advice do you have for people that are like struggling to feel like, oh, how can I better pitch this or present this information in a way that would help them, like the, the they being the product owners or stakeholders would help give the thumbs up on prioritizing that work. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. And if if I think on my previous experiences with other projects, I think, and this is something that I think, and I'm going to try to, you know, experiment more in the future, is uh, measuring. Measuring is very important and is ultimately what has allowed to drive certain initiatives in my previous projects and I've seen it for other other teams as well where once you once you have metrics and data to know how is function your application your service or your mobile application maybe you have stats about how many crashes you get in a specific part and then you as a developer might know what is the what is the reason that you're getting so many crashes on that specific part of the app. Uh, you know of the underlying problems. So if you can bring up that data to help you advocate to fix those those problems, I think it's easier. And same and same happens for your 
for your services, right? If you have some observability in place, you um, maybe you can see the number of errors that are happening for a specific endpoint, or if you have performance tests that can inform you what are the things that are worth to advocate for also. And I think that also helps you as a developer to keep you a little bit more objective on the things that you want to advocate. Because if it's something that you just don't like the style of how something is written, let's say, oh, I want to try this new architecture. But if you look at the metrics or something, there's really not much of a problem for that part of the application, then what is the point of doing doing that? So I think, yeah, metrics can help you as a developer as well to, to understand what is it worth to pay for. So another, another topic that I wanted to dig into was around, because another thing that you mentioned about well maintains operating is testing. And a lot of people talk about testing. You know, in, in some of our precursor to this conversation, you'd mentioned uh, meaningful tests. Like, what's the difference between a meaningful test and, and I suppose, maybe a non-meaningful test? When can a test be not meaningful? Yeah, I specifically talk about that part because I have worked in code bases where, um, you know, teams, we want to have a specific percentage of uh, coverage tests. A measurable uh, yeah, measure, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to say, hey, we have 90% of tests, but then sometimes those tests are a little bit painful to my team, and, and, or even, you know, they're fl flicky tests, or I've seen tests where they test the models where um, there's really not much value that that, that test is not it's not catching bugs or it's not helping me um, as a developer. So I, I am advocate of writing tests, but also, okay, okay keeping in mind, what, what do we want to test? How is this going to help me while I'm writing the code and for other developers in the future? Am I writing the test in a way that is, that is also easy to change. Again, my uh, reference, my mentor that I mentioned earlier, he used to say testing is code too. So the, the test that we are writing is, is code as well. So we should see it with the same care that we write, you know, our feature code. So I, I think that sometimes we might forget that and and you know maybe repeating some code in the test and that makes it also difficult to maintain is that the end is also code so i yeah i think i was referring to meaningful tests and be, being a little bit using common sense of what what classes or what code is it makes sense to to write this for and just for providing, like, if, if and if you don't have an immediate example that comes to mind, but can you think of a, a test that you were like, we should just get rid of this because this is not providing enough enough value to the code base? Um, I talk about this example of uh, some tests that I, I've seen that they were just testing if we had the properties in the models, which maybe there was a reason, again, <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, we shouldn't be quick to jump to conclusions, but I didn't find them very helpful. Also, flicky test. If you find yourself struggling with development, and I think again that happened to me. That has happened to me on uh, mobile code bases that I have worked um, with UI test, which it makes it extremely painful to add. Uh, features and the test might not be really helping and uh, the devs to catch bugs and it's just more trouble to try to, you know, understand what's happening with that flicky test and it takes you to write features and other different tests for, for that feature. So, yeah, I think some some 
some cases like like that that will consider not using them or removing them. Mm, right, right. I, I, I can appreciate that. And I think about, I'm, I'm reminded of like some projects where I'll work on a software project where there's a lot of tests already there. And then uh, like a bug might have show up in production. And my inclination is always to see if like, how do I, how can I reproduce this bug? Can I reproduce it with a test just to see if like do some integration type thing? Like it seemed like a user equal got to this point and something happened and how hard, how difficult is it to reproduce the bug in a test? But then, so I might like write tests to do that and see if I can make them like, oh, cool. Then I can hopefully zone in on where the problem is. But then there's always this question of like, should I leave this test in that I kind of was just using to help reproduce something? Or is this, if I keep it, is this now adding more? It's like, oh, but it's a hope because like, I think sometimes I just worry about like, well, what if this happens again? But if you like use that to help spot a problem and fix the problem, do you need to keep the thing to prevent that one edge case from ever happening again? And then sometimes I worry that I've over the history of my career, I might have left a little too many of those tests that were very much edge case things that helped me problem solve, but that didn't necessarily need to persist in the code for the indefinite, like, because that's just going to slow down the overall test suite just to kind of avoid that one little one off thing. Like, oh, someone had an extra space in something and then just highlighted a bug in a different part of the application or something. But do you have, do you do things like that when you're debugging? Do you use tests as part of your way to? Find uh, find a solution to something. Yeah, and I think I I haven't been as thoughtful as you of thinking on the future because I do that very often and I just leave the test because uh, I like you said I I think oh this might help in the in the future I didn't even think before and stop and asking oh is this how this test is helping the, the, the code base in the future is just slowing the suite down and is this really prone to happen again? Does, does it make sense to keep it? I definitely will do that more in the in the future because I, I don't right now. I think uh, I don't know if like that approach is better or not. It's just something that I've I realized that I've done a number of times. I think it's probably a little bit because when I send a pull request to someone I want to have tests to show that it, this was failing. I proved that it, this is my way of showing that something was break broken. I, I produced a failing test, and then I fixed the thing, which made the test pass. So that got, all gets merged together. Where, where's the PR for like? Okay, now let's get rid of that test because we don't. That was just to demonstrate to the. In some ways, it was like a way of communicating. I am showing that I fixed the problem to someone else that I couldn't maybe be looking at this, the monitor at the same time and see, see how it was broken and now it's fixed. And so I don't know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that a little bit more as just like a general team agreement type topic or not, I suppose. Another thing I wanted to kind of was curious with you, to talk with you about was what's the difference between strategic programming and tactical programming? Oh, yeah. I, I run into this concept while reading a book called Philosophy of Software Design. Yeah, so I really like this concept of uh, tactical and strategic programming. I It spoke to me a lot because I have experience how teams tend to do tactical programming, you know, trying to get the product out of the door and doing things fast. And you know, many companies have this model of do things fast, break things or whatever that is the model. I don't, I don't even know, but yeah, I've, I've seen that as I mentioned earlier as well, we often sacrifice testing and the name of doing things faster. It really spoke to me to do things on a more a strategic way, try to think a little bit more about design before we, we try to implement a feature. And of course, using common sense, you know, if you're working on an MVP or if you are, uh, sorry, in a POC, of course, you want to do these things faster. Of course, you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to find the perfect design because that doesn't exist either. So you just want to spend some time trying to think about different solutions. I like to think about more than one solution because it's not about finding, 
you know, the perfect solution. There's no perfect. It's just you just find different ways of solving the problem and you collaborate with your team on deciding, okay, where are the trade-offs that we are willing to accept with this solution? Where are the advantages, disadvantages of each? So again, I try to advocate more on my projects to do some sort of initial design upfront of what for features that we want to want to build and gather feedback for those solutions that we're proposing. I think something one of the things you touched on there was around, you know, like maybe being more tactical when you're in trying to move fast when, you know, break things when you're like in that proof of concept phase or working on your your MVP project. How often do you feel like teams know where they are in the life cycle of a software project to know where that line is like, oh, now we now we should really start being more strategic because this seems like a real thing? Or how do people make that distinction? Because like a lot of people might start a project with the best of intentions thinking, let's come up with like a, the ideal architecture for how we're going to do things. And then other people might argue, you might be getting a little ahead of yourself. Like, let's just see if there's a anyone that wants to use the product first before someone's got to pay for the product or the, the software. It's just kind of weird, uh, this weird dance that I think software developers may be not always knowing where they're at or a com- where a company or where that piece of software is at in its life cycle to know, like, is it super obvious when you you start making that transition to like, okay, we let's slow down and be more thoughtful now because you can also slow down and be super thoughtful early on and then never get anything shipped too. And so it's like this, like, where's that line for people? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I I think I've been in projects where we realize a general project and, you know, uh, developers start strolling, adding features, uh, if things uh, are getting complex. You start voicing these problems and try to advocate for for that and say, hey, can we slow down? I've been in, in those situations where... Yeah, developers are strolling and we start bringing up these problems and some companies we try, okay, stakeholders might buy in and that and say, okay, we are uh, we are maturing uh, and and now we want to put uh, strategies, uh, strategies in place to, you know, empower engineering teams to uh, make the changes that they need. Unfortunately, I think we see it too late sometimes. And that's why I try to advocate now from, from whatever is a feature. It's a, it's a Greenfield project. I have I did that with one of the Greenfield projects that I work on the on the past. Okay, let's let's take some time to I know we want a product. It was an MVP. And oh, okay, I I, I I know we want to have we want to get something fast, but we need to get at least a little bit of thought, have a, some documentation in place because ultimately this is what is going to help the product in in the in the future. So I don't know what is the I don't know what is the line, uh, unfortunately. I don't know if we can ever figure out where the line is. Maybe I think that's just, it's it's maybe whatever the team is or the you know, what they agree on where that line is. I suppose, but there's also this interesting thing that we can see happening where you might be going really fast for a while, and then you're going to naturally start to slow down because of all the the lack of t- the amount of time you've slowed down. It's kind of like this weird you know counterintuitive thing. Like either you're going to slow yourself down, or you're going to need to slow down so you can go fast again and it's like this careful dance i suppose that which makes different teams different right and not all not all software projects are going to run and and be as successful as each other at the same outcome or there's a lot of elements at play and some software projects you might be working on you might be doing everything you possibly do to be strategic and be thoughtful but then maybe the business doesn't isn't able to sell the thing or isn't able to get customers or whatever it may not you know, it may, it may not continue being a software project forever either. So the tricky balance when you're trying to build things that will last, but you don't know if the thing's going to last for things outside of the control of the code, right? There's a lot of other factors as well. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you, you talk about, you know, trying to get customers or users for the product. I think that's a very important piece that as engineers, we should be 
mindful of and be curious. Uh, we often t- talk about, oh, uh, stakeholders don't understand that we we have all this technical debt, but it was it, it goes both ways. Uh, we also have to be open to listen. Okay, why why do you want this feature so badly? Why do we have to get and and trying to understand what is what we want the product to move towards on the end. So it's it, I think it goes both both ways and it's really important to pay attention and listen as engineers. We'll be back with our interview with Nolita in just a moment. Hi, it's me. Robbie. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you for making time to listen to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these conversations valuable, please consider sharing a link amongst your peers on social media and or writing a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to help spread the word. Also, do you know someone that I should be interviewing on Maintainable? Shoot me an email to Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm and state your case. And now, let's get back to our interview with Nalita Velasquez. A couple of quick last questions for you. Is there a non-technical, non-software related book that you find yourself recommending to peers very often? Non-technical book. Well, I can only remember uh, the last book that I really enjoy that is non-technical, which is called Mexican Gothic. It's a novel. Again, I don't remember the, the author, but it's Gothic no, novel, really interesting. I love reading that, that type of book, just short stories, uh, novels. Uh, I find myself often super into into that and getting lost uh, on on those kind of kind of books. I, I found that book really really interesting, very easy to read. That's great. I'll definitely look that up and share links to that in the show notes for everybody as well. Is this Mexican Gothic. Mm-hmm. And where can listeners best follow your thoughts and ruminations about software engineering online? Uh, I have a blog post uh, called tolkiana.com. That is T-O-L-K-I-A-N-A.com. And um, I write about the things that I learned um, main, mainly. So I learned something and I write about that because I think it helps me to uh, solidified a little bit and hopefully it helps other people as well. So mainly there, I don't tweet a lot. I have Twitter, but I don't use it very often. Well, great. I'll definitely include links to all those in the show notes for everybody. And with that, it's been such a delight having you join us on Maintainable, Nalita. Thank you so much for stopping by the talk shop. Yeah. Thank you so much again for having me. 